We'll go ahead. Go ahead and start here. Um, well, Ed and Christelle are on their way. Um, so yeah, as as mentioned, just for the recording, the quiz that was open last week will be reopened this Thursday with the same topics: alkane nomenclature and acid-base chemistry. Um, and then we'll be start getting into the new whichever all the quizzes will be shifted back a week. Um, and but we should be about you know, able to make up that ground as we go through. Um, so the reason we have a whole we have a whole lecture here on this, and it's the acid base chemistry and organic chemistry is basically a an extension of the acid base chemistry that we talked about in Gen Chem. But whereas in Gen Chem we were really focused more on the idea of equilibrium. Um, and like, how do we use Ka to calculate concentrations and pH? Um, in organic chemistry, we do it. We basically have um, a way to look at it in terms of, of pKa's, where we don't actually need to set up a full ice table. We're generally going to be looking more at whether something is protonated or deprotonated and at what approximate ratio at a given pH, as opposed to trying to determine what the pH of a solution is going to be. We are more interested in these organic molecules that are weak acids or bases, and how do we, how do we know what form we're likely to find them in? Because we can move back and forth between the protonated and the deprotonated pretty easily by adjusting the pH with strong acids or bases. Um, so just like a lot of things in organic chemistry, it's the same concepts from Gen Chem, but with a shifted frame of reference. All right, so here's our original definitions of acids. <clears throat> um, an Arrhenius acid was the was the simplest and I believe chronologically the first definition of an acid, or it's the first modern definition of an acid. And it was basically anything that when you put it in water increases the concentration of H plus. That changes slightly for us in organic chemistry because we're not always using water-based solutions anymore. We're dealing with a lot of other solvents. Um, and so the Arrhenius acid is not really a great definition for OCHEM. We're basically going to ignore that definition for OCHEM um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, Bronson Lowry, so historical side note, um, Svante Arrhenius um, is actually, um, should be better known for his work on climate science in the late 1800s. Uh, he was the first one who published peer-reviewed evidence um, that anthropogenic climate change was real. Um, in, I think it was 1880 or something like that. Um, of course, he was, he was Swedish and uh, it was, he did not fully understand the implications on the, the rest of the meteorological system. Um, so he actually thought the climate change in general is going to be a net positive for humanity because he thought, oh, there'll be more farmable land because there will be things won't freeze as often. Um, <laughs> so while he, while he didn't fully understand all the implications, he actually did come up with a model that actually that we still use to this day with that they've added adjustments to it. Um, but it's a pretty, pretty well understood system even back in the 1880s. Um, and he also did a whole bunch of work in acid-based chemistry and a lot of, of fundamental research into what would become modern chemistry. Did he come up with the idea of pH based on a concentration of pH plus? I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, there were a few of them. Bronson and Lowry weren't that far behind him, so that might have been. Um, We'll get there. I'll, I'll check that at, at uh, break. Remind me. Um, so Bronson and Lowry were the ones who came up with the most commonly used if we're thinking about um, the molecular structure. Bronson-Lowry acid is going to be the one that's our go-to, especially in OCHEM. 
when we're talking about is something an asset or a base, the number one way that we think about it is, is it giving away a proton, an H plus, or is it accepting an H plus? And once again, Lewis acid is um, just a way to reframe that because you can have things that don't have protons, that don't have H pluses, but still increase the concentration of H plus in water. Um, and the way they do that is by acting as an electron acceptor. So it's, again, it's a way of like, okay, well, there's these sort of fringe cases. It was uh, Soren Sorensen who came up with the PhD. Soren Sorensen. <laughs> yeah. Now, there, the Northern Europe in the 18th, in the 1880s was, you know, Bronsted, Arrhenius, Soren Sorensen. Um, they were doing a lot of the work in acid base chemistry. So, uh, if we had something like in iron, iron is iron three ions are notoriously good as Lewis acids. You put, say, iron nitrate into water, the pH drops, the solution becomes more acidic, despite the fact that the iron doesn't actually have any H pluses it can give. So the way that that actually works is you think about this three plus here being surrounded by all these water molecules forming these intermolecular forces. And really it would be more like an octahedral geometry, six things attached, but for the, for simplicity's sake, as, as you start pulling electron density towards the iron ion, just by making those ion dipole attractive forces, you actually weaken these bonds to the point where you can actually wind up with the oxygen basically kicking a hydrogen off. Hmm. And then, so then you wind up with, this winds up attaching to another water molecule that has a lone pair. And so you get H3O plus, you get hydronium out of it, despite the fact that the iron didn't have any uh, H pluses to give. So this is an example of a Lewis acid, and we'll see some Lewis acids. For the most part, in organic chemistry, everything that acts as an acid has a readily available H plus. They're almost always. Um, the few times that we use a Lewis acid in lab um, is generally going to be um, for it to bond with the uh, with the organic molecule and make it more acidic, the same way it does to the water molecules there. And in that case, the, the, we call it the electron acceptor because it's pulling electron density away from something else. So it's making something else more acidic and in doing so, changing the pH of the solution. So it's the oxygen in that example that was forming the electron density with the hydrogen and so the the iron is pulling the electron density away from oxygen which is in turn pulling electron density away from the hydrogen you're pulling the whole system is pulling electron density that way so lewis acid one way you can think about it is lewis acids make other molecules better bronze than lowry acids okay there we go by pulling, by accepting the electron, it makes the oxygen better at giving up the uh, proton. And then uh, you probably remember that bases in, in general are the exact opposite, the inverse. I mean, the, the better way to say that. Um, so if an acid is Bronsted Lowry, or a Bronsted Lowry acid is a proton donor. Bronson Lowry base is the proton acceptor. Same with Lewis bases. Lewis acid, the electron acceptor was the acid. Lewis base, the electron donor is the base. So our water in our last example was a Lewis base because it was donating the electrons to the iron. And so and then One more time on that, sorry. <laughs> so let's let's redraw it again real quick. I was trying to come up with like a, an acronym to make it work. I so I was just thinking about use Lewis or Bronson Lowry as your basis. Okay. 
And then just remember Lewis acids and bases, you're talking about electrons, so the donor and the acceptor are flipped. So Lewis acid accepts? Lewis acid accepts electrons. And then Lewis base donates the electrons. So, so in our water molecule here, so here's our Lewis acid. It's pulling electron density towards itself. So it's the electron acceptor. The electrons are coming from the water. So the, that makes the water the electron donor and, gotcha. and increases the H plus by making it easier to pull that H plus off. So you said uh, Lewis acid makes Bronsted Lowry acid stronger? Or something and, along those lines? And Lewis acid is making the water a better, a stronger Bronsted Lowry acid. It is, and again, <laughs> defining your terms is really important, right? Um, uh, and again, our, our radius space doesn't look like it's fully the opposite because we're talking about the equilibrium here, right? So auto ionization of water. is an equilibrium process in pure water, right? So it makes H3O plus and OH minus. <laughs> I hit the wrong one. Uh, there we go. So imagine I can drive a minus there without exiting the slide. Um, so if you, if a Arrhenius acid increases your concentration here, and Arrhenius base increases this concentration, but because they are um, inversely proportional, when you increase the H3O plus concentration, by definition, you decrease hydroxide concentration because they have that, our equilibrium expression for this process is, Concentration of H3O plus times concentration of hydroxide equals a constant. So the base increases this, which by definition decreases this. The acid increases your hydronium, which by definition decreases hydroxide. All right. Okay, everybody remembers the first rule of equilibrium, right? <laughs> uh, products over reactants. So, oh, okay. so in this case, I did that's write out the phase of memory. <laughs> yeah. um, aqueous and aqueous, right? And but these were liquids, so our equilibrium expression. Those here, wouldn't count. Those don't count. That's the third rule of equilibrium. First two rules of equilibrium are products over reactants. The third rule is solids and liquids don't show up in the equilibrium expression. So this is our complete equilibrium expression for, uh, for water because the liquids don't show up. Uh, this is more review here with the term conjugate base. Um, so one way you can think about conjugate acid and conjugate base is that it's the conjugate base is acting as the Bronsted-Lowry base if the reaction was reversed, if it went backwards. The other way you can think about it that might be more helpful in organic chemistry is that the conjugate base is the deprotonated form of the acid. So we're going to talk about conjugate acid base pairs a lot in this class. Um, and because we're we're going to look at it. So if we did something like um, acetic acid and ammonia. Just started combining the two.
So acetic acid looks like this. Ammonia. If acetic acid acts as an acid, ammonia acts as a base, we're going to get what? Very good. Again, aqueous. Yeah. So when you first learned the term conjugate acid, and conjugate base, we just said, okay, well, if the reaction went backward, what's the acid and what's the base? We'd say that the acid is, is the NH4 and the base is acetic acid, is the acetate. I want to start thinking more about these two are paired. When you acetic acid acts as an acid, it always makes the same conjugate base, right? So you can think about this as acetic acid is the propanated form, acetate is the depropanated form of the same molecule. For, for whatever reason, we're first learning polyatomic ions and acids, it seems like everybody thinks about them as nitrate is different than nitric acid. And it is, but it's really the same thing with an H plus added, right? If it's the same thing with an H plus, these two were always going to be paired together. And we're going to rank acids in terms of how strong they are by looking at what's the equilibrium constant for this reaction in water, which is what we call pKa. And so our, our acid or our conjugate acid base pair for ammonia would be ammonia. All right, so here's nitrous acid and water. Water is acting as the base. The conjugate acid of water is hydronium. And the conjugate base of nitrous acid is nitrite. All right, so let's try some with organic compounds instead of just looking at inorganics. Unless we specify Lewis acid or Arrhenius acid, in general, we're going to be able to do it. I'm okay with us all making the assumption the Bronsted Lowry acid when we say acid. Will they ever be different when we run into something like that, where it's like a Lewis acid and the other one's acting as a Bronsted Lowry acid? Or those would be more fringe cases, and probably those would be specified. The default is Bronsted Lowry acid in, in textbooks and in other in places beyond organic chemistry, chemistry in general. Like when you go to a bio classroom, take a bio biochemistry class, they're going to use acid and bronze as Bronsted Lowry acid. All right, so this first one can I this is actually one where the organic chemistry way of looking at things actually makes things a little bit easier to see. It's really easy to see that this is the exact same molecule missing an H plus. So that's really easy to pair things up. So that makes it, so you can say acid conjugate base. 
And then by process of elimination, base conjugate acid. Usually, easily just click the whole reaction and save it. Once water is the it's acid. a lot easier to write right. it this way. <laughs> yeah, once you see the pairs and how that works, it's the whole idea of conjugate acid base. And, and that's why we frequently talk about them almost like in the same way as half reactions. Remember half right. reactions? Yeah. There's a half, there's an acidic half reaction and a basic half reaction. And you can, you can separate those out, it's easy to see how they pair up. The acid, what's the base here? Acid is the acid would be the good. <laughs> I switched colors here, but I'm writing it out, so I think we can everybody can track that. So, in the same molecule, you still have that carbonyl group. So, there's our conjugate base. Nitrogens with negative charges are usually exceptionally good bases. So we see this a lot as when you want to pull off a hydrogen that wouldn't normally be considered acidic, you use a deprotonated nitrogen because it's going to work really hard to take that to take that hydrogen and make itself more stable. So that would make this our conjugate acid. This is our base. So with this one, can resonance work into where you could end up with a different reverse? There's this is the resonance is the reason why there's a whole bunch of hydrogens here, right? There's three hydrogens there, one there, two hydrogens there, and three hydrogens here. Why does it pick one of these three? It's because of the resonance. Right. Resin the the resonance that you get on the on the conjugate base, the deprotonated form, there's going to be a resonance structure that looks like that, right? So then, then it would look like so. The fact that we get a resonance structure out of this is why it preferentially is going to pull hydrogen off of one carbon away from the carbonyl from that, we call that the alpha carbon. Could that then act as a base and steal the... And then that can then go out act as a base from something else if you have other things around. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we try to limit what other molecules are around in, in some in a lot of reactions is because this still is not that stable. If there's a, something else that it can react with around to make itself more stable, it will. And this will be a very short lived intermediate. If we want this to stick around um, long enough to do something with it, we want to control what else it could, it could potentially bump into. So this wouldn't work in water. This wouldn't work in water. If you do this in water, it's going to immediately pull a hydrogen from water because water is a better acid. Gotcha. Um, than, in fact, if you did this with any water, it would probably bypass the step entirely. You just get the nitrogen hmm. pulling a water, or pulling a hydrogen off of the water to make hydroxide. Gotcha. All right, so and we, we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, what we call carboxylic acids is this functional group right here, right? Anytime you've got a, a carbon that's, we got a carbonyl and then hydroxide attached to the same carbon, that collectively is a carboxylic acid. Can you put it as a carbonyl and alcohol? Because yeah. Um, but, and really we don't, we, we classify this whole functional group as a carbonyl functional group, but it's a carboxylic. But it's really it's a it's its own thing. Would it be a different thing if it was functioning in a different reaction? Like right here, it's a carboxylic acid, but if it's functioning, it's something else. No, we still would put it onto our list. Like if we're 
if we're naming the molecule, we would still name it as a carboxylic acid. It's more about does it have this functional group? Um, does it have this group of atoms or anything like that? Then it's actual, I don't want to say function, but, but how it's behaving in the reaction. Okay. But that's a good question. The yeah, function is the bad wording on that. <laughs> right. But because it, it it's function, if you want to put it that way in this reaction, is as the acid, but it's still a carboxylic acid when it's not acting as an acid. I'm trying not to anthropomorphize them too much, but uh, I'm still a chemistry teacher when I'm not teaching chemistry. Right. Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this, this, you can look at it. <laughs> All right, so quick reminder about our definition of what Ka is. So earlier we looked at auto ionization of water, but really we had a more blanket definition for something that can act as an acid with water. We just said, okay, if you have an acid in water, the equilibrium expression is going to look like this, except we're not going to include that because it's a liquid, right? So we actually wind up with a Ka expression that looks like concentration of the deprotonated form times concentration of H3O plus over concentration of the protonated form. And so there's our conjugate acid base pair, right? We've got the deprotonated form and the protonated form. And this definition and the how the pH and pKa work is going to wind up being the bedrock for how we actually think about these in terms of how they behave in the lab. Um, because if we take this expression, if we take the negative log here, so remember P just as a whole of anything just always means negative log base 10 of that concentration, right? So it should be pH 3O plus instead of pH, but they didn't realize how H pluses worked in water that they glommed on to another water molecule when, when this was first. Um, derived. So they just called it pH because it was easier. So pH is your negative log concentration of H3O plus. But then there's also pKa. pKa is your negative log of Ka. So P as an operator just means take the negative log of something typically a concentration, but we do see it um, sometimes as just a way like, okay, we're, this is Ka is de defined in terms of concentrations. Um, and so we can use this as a shorthand basically. So if you take that Ka expression that we had before, Ka equals deprotonated times H3O plus, over protonated, we can actually take the negative log of that and just do some, some algebra with it. If we take the negative log of that, we're going to get pKa equals negative log of A minus over HA. And remember from your laws of logs that we could separate out terms. If we had it, something multiplied together within the thing we took the KAM, we could turn that into plus negative log of H3O plus, which we already have a definition for. Would it not be the negative log of H3O plus over the concentration of your? No, because the, because the way that multiplying fractions together works, we don't have to have over a common denominator because laws of logs are weird that way. Um, it's almost stupid. 
<laughs> well, because there's a plus sign there. It's easy to think of why we'd have to add those together. But yeah, because it's it's we're separating out the terms in the law, we get that just by itself, which we already have a convenient definition for that term, right? So what we'll actually get. PKA equals pH which you could it's a plus P in this ratio. But we don't usually do that with that P operator. And since we have this negative sign here anyway, we usually just rearrange this. This is the derivation brought in, in Gen Chem called the buffer rule or the buffer equation. Um, because you get pH of a buffered system is equal to pKa of the weak acid of the conjugate acid base pair plus the log of A minus over HA. Okay, so we're not actually going to make much in the way of buffers in this class, though. So, how does that really help us? Well, if again, but if we shift our frame of reference so that instead of thinking about um, just in terms of making a buffer, we can also use the if we know the pH of the system and we know what K or what pKa is, we can estimate whether more of our reactant or more of our conjugate acid base pair is it is it more likely to be deprotonated or protonated? So instead of thinking about like I'm going to mix these two in a certain ratio to get the buffer, if we think about it in terms of I've already got this solution. Is my weak acid protonated or deprotonated? Would it be wrong for me to throw out there pH minus pKa equals that log of? No, in fact, we can we can do more rearranging here. If we solve for A minus over HA as a ratio, e to the pH minus pKa. That it's uh, log base ten, but yes. Oh. So concentration of A minus over concentration of H plus or HA is equal to 10 to the pH minus pKa. In other words, this ratio is, is determined by how far away is the pH from the pKa. If you had something that was considerably more acidic than the pKa, that means pH is lower than pKa, right? And you get a difference here, mathematics. So let's say, let's just fill in some random numbers. Um, so, so with that, can we also say that the, the negative log of your hydronium concentration times your Ka to the 10th power gives you that ratio. Do you want to show us that again? <laughs> so you could further simplify that. Most, most of the tables and things that we're going to look at, it turns out that it's easier to do the math if you leave it as pH and pKa. One, because we measure our solutions in pH, not directly in hydronium concentration. And two, in you know, a lot of organic chemical textbooks, they keep the Ka's as pKa's. It's easy enough to get Ka from that, but watch what happens here with this. So, so let's say that we're at pH of, um, let's say 4.5, and pKa for benzoic acid is 5.5. That's much easier to plug in. Yeah. That's easier what to plug in, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Mathematically, it'll wind up being the same thing, though. So 
we're one pH unit more acidic than the pKa. So negative. Actually, let's let's go with the even simpler case first. What happens when the pH is equal to the pKa? If one is your ratio, so the ratio is even. Right. So pH is equal to pKa. This gets we get ten to the zero, right? And anything times ten to the or anything to the zero power is one, right? So you get if your pH is equal to the pKa, you get your concentration of the deprotonated form and the protonated form is one. In other words, you have an equal amount, a 50-50 split between protonated and unprotonated when you're at when your pH is equal to the pKa. Don't think about the math for a second, but think about the logic. If it if pH is equal to pKa and you get a 50-50 mixture, if you dump a bunch of extra H pluses into the system, just from an equilibrium standpoint, what's going to happen? Think about the Chateliers. If you have we have HA in equilibrium and it's turning, I'm going to write the simplified version without the without a base present. That's that's the half the half reaction. What's happening with the weak acid, right? You got the protonated form and it goes to deprotonated and something else gets an H plus. When your pH is equal to pKa, these two are equal. So let's say we're at we're at equilibrium with these two being equal. What happens if, to equilibrium if you dump a whole bunch more H plus? Who remembers Le Chatelier's principle? What is it? What uh, in plain language? Do you want to give me a more reactive? So, hold on, hold that thought. Oh, like right. um, so if you add more on the right side, it, I think it shifts to the left. Exactly. When it tries to undo whatever change is made, right, to get back to equilibrium. So now go. I was going to say more reactants will yield to more product or more products and vice versa. Right. So if we add a whole bunch more re our products, it shifts this way, right? So without even looking at the map, you can say, okay, if our pH is under our pKa, that means we have extra H pluses around, right? If we have extra H pluses around, it makes more of the protonated. What happens if we take away a bunch of this? If we make it more basic by lowering that concentration? The acid's getting more deprotonated. The acid deprotonates, we shift to the product side. So if we think about pH, if we think about this as our, as our baseline, Use this as your, your point of reference here and say, okay, if it's more acidic than pKa, I have extra H pluses, therefore I've got more protonated. If I've got, if the pH is above pKa, then that means we, we don't have enough product and we need to make more product. So we're going to shift to the deprotonated side. So look at your original example with the 4.5 pH. That would just be what, one tenth. So you have one. So you plug in 10 to the 4.5 minus 5.5. We're going to get 10 to the negative one, right? Which is one over 10 or 0.1. Basically, the difference between your pH and your pKa is going to be a factor of 10 difference in this ratio. For this case, where the pH is 4.5, but your pKa is 5.5, you're going to have 10 times as much protonated as deprotonated. So shift this reaction to the left. Exactly. By adding extra H pluses, making it more acidic, makes it shift this way. And we get extra protonated 
compared to the 50-50 case. And every time you shift one pH unit away from pKa, it's a factor of 10. That's where it's really nice and clean. And why pH and pKa is a lot easier to think about. Just think about it in terms of powers of 10. If pH was, let's say if pH was, uh, we'll do 7.5. Even, even, even pH units. Now it's more basic than the pKa, right? More basic means more protonated or deprotonated? Deprotonated. Deprotonated. We took away the protons. So we're going to shift to make more deprotonated. And by what ratio? 100 to 1. Right. So think about it in powers of 10. And that's why we keep it in pH and pKa, because then you don't actually need to plug it into a calculator to get a rough idea of is it protonated or deprotonated. Is this going to be like the slide for the class? <laughs> um, for that idea, yeah, I think I probably have it a little bit neater um, coming up. So hold that thought, but the whole second half of class is doing more practice with this, and then why does it matter? All right, so here's the other way of looking at pKa. So now that we have that as our background, pKa is useful because it allows us something to compare to the pH. pKa is a measure of acid strength. If you have a low pKa, that's a really good acid. It's really good at giving away that H plus to become more stable. Or you can think about it as the conjugate base is really stable. If it's a high pKa, that means it's not a very good acid and the opposite is true. It's actually the conjugate base is really good at pulling away H pluses from other things. And so typically that's gonna be sort of the, the back and forth. If it's a good acid, it's a bad base. Then the conjugate base is a bad base. If it's a good base, then the conjugate acid is a bad acid. Because we're always, we're all about making things more stable, right? And if it's more stable when it's deprotonated, it's gonna be hard to protonate it. It's hard to make it act as a base if it's really good at giving up an H plus. And so here's some examples of some of the really, of really strong acids. So here acid has pKa of negative nine. In order for, to get sulfuric acid to that equilibrium state of 50-50, we actually would have to get to a pH of negative nine, which you can't do. Solubility of water doesn't allow that in water. So that's why anything with a negative pKa, actually, well, Anything with a pKa that's more negative than hydronium is our definition of a strong base. When you put it in water, it dissociates 100% of the time within sig figs. It's not really dissociating 100% of the time because even sulfuric acid has a pKa value, meaning it is an equilibrium reaction. But look at the difference between these two pKa's. Negative nine and negative one, but even if we call that negative two, that's a difference of seven pH units, right? Which means if we put these in a mixture at a 50 50 ratio, then be 10 to the seven times more 10 million. 10 million times more of the sulfuric acid being deprotonated than the, than the hydronium being deprotonated. So that's why we just say we, for these strong acids, back in when you first learned about acids and bases, we just said they dissociate 100% of the time because that's good enough within sig figs. One out of every 10 million is not deprotonated. Nobody's carrying that many sig figs anyway. So only mathematicians carry about that number in decimal places. Water is like one out of every 10 million. 
turns into like a hydrogen. So that's that our um, H2O plus H2O goes to H3O plus and hydroxide. The equilibrium constant that is 10 to the fourth minus 14. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we wind up with, yeah, about one out of every 10 million, about 10 to the minus seven is your concentration. Um, actually, it winds up being more like 10 to the minus eight when you actually look at con the ratio because water is 55 molar in itself. The, the molarity of pure water is 55 moles per liter. So it will be another factor of 10 factor, or, um, on there. But yes, we're dealing with such small amounts that sometimes they're measurable, but in terms of plugging them into calculations, it's not worth it. So this could be considered a reaction of water in itself mm -hmm. and water dissolving in itself. Correct. Okay, right on. And then follow up applying pH and pKa to this reaction when we're looking at pKa or something like Well, right there. That's it. The pKa of hydronium in water is negative 1.74. Okay. The pKa of, of hydroxide in water is 15.7. When you, when you wind up combining those to get the combined reaction here, you get 10 to the minus 14. Mm -hmm. So they're both, it's not that this is 14 and this is zero. But the difference between them, when you wind up with all multiplying them out, is, is 10 to the minus 14 within sig figs. Yeah, you wind up with the, this one minus this one creates a difference that with the negative sign, you wind up with the difference being 14 between these two, when you subtract Ka1 from Ka2, you combine them, because you have to flip one of them over. Yeah. Right, and so that flips the, the, the sign on. That's interesting, subtracting the big one from the small one is the baseline. <laughs> it is, because this is really two reactions happening, right? Mm -hmm. And when you think back to Hess's law for equilibrium, we had to take Ka1 and multiply it by K, by the inverse of Ka2, Ka1 over Ka2. Mm -hmm. And that ratio, so that ratio is going to give us a difference of 10 to the 14 when we do that. Because we also have some log terms in there, because these are pKa's. All right. The other reason why it's really helpful to have these listed in order like this is because it allows for these generalizations. Strongest acids are on the left-hand side at the top. Strongest bases are on the right-hand side at the bottom. The weakest acid has the strongest conjugate base. Right, in other words, this is stable. This is really unstable. It's hard to make it go this way. So it'll react that way and said this equilibrium play is way, you can think about these as having equilibrium arrows between each of these, right? And these are equilibrium constants. The more negative the equilibrium constant, the further equilibrium lies to the right. The bigger the Ka value, the more equilibrium lies to the left because pKa, P has that negative log term. All right, let's finish this thought and we'll take a break. So here's a, a molecule. I like this one partly just because the name's funny. Propranol. Um, the other thing to notice up here is that you got a bunch of like sort of 
functional groups here. Like this is for a specific molecule, but any molecule that has that acid anhydride group is going to have about the same pKa. It'll vary a little bit based on resonance, but like all alcohols. So here's two representative alcohols, 16 to 18. All your alcohols are going to fall somewhere in that range, right around 16 to 18. And you'll notice all of your amines, amines in general, are going to be way down here. So for this molecule, and even below that is where we get to like alkanes or carbon hydrogen. Most carbon hydrogen bonds are way down at the bottom. They're not very good acids. Nitrogens are, are not very good acids, but they're better than carbon hydrogens. And then oxygen hydrogens are better than that. And then your halogen hydrogen bonds are way up here. So out of this molecule, what part of it is going to be the best, the most acidic proton out of all of the hydrogens on this molecule? Which one is going to be the easiest to pull off? Probably the alcohol, right? Yeah. yeah. So this one could be acidic if you put it into a rough enough, a, a basic enough solution, but only after all of these are already gone. So when things think about how H2SO4, that's a polyprotic acid, right? Remember that term from Gen Chem? As more than one proton it can give up? They don't all have the same Ka value, though. The first proton is easier to take off than the second proton. So we have more than one acidic P, uh, proton here that we could look at. The most acidic is the one that's where the functional group is highest on this list. We don't have any carbonyls. So we're not looking at this area up here. We have an alcohol, we have an amine, and we have carbon hydrogens. So out of those, the alcohol is going to be the most acidic. Then we would expect that, well, is there any resonance going to be affecting things much? Not really. It's they're all just it's a pair. These lone pairs can resonate with the with the pi system yeah. here, but there's an sp3 carbon and an sp3 carbon between the nitrogen and the oxygen and the other oxygen. So when you pull that hydrogen off, it's going to be it's going to act more or less like it's an isolated alcohol because it is electronically isolated. Considering the conjugate phase of this acid. Saying that it's fully deprotonated, even the nitrogen loses its protons. Would the reverse see the hydrogens first bonding with the oxygen then? No, back to the nitrogen the because the nitrogen is so greedy. Okay. Nitrogen is such a good base that it's going to be, it's going to, it's kind of like first in, last out. It's the hardest to pull the hydrogen away from the nitrogen, so the nitrogen is also going to be the first one to get the hydrogens back. So if our alcohols are most acidic here, there's no resonance to worry about. What kind of range would we be looking at? Just really ballpark. 16, 17. Yeah, somewhere in there. We got a primary alcohol at 16, a tertiary alcohol at 18. Methanol might be somewhere in the 15 range, but it's going to be somewhere in this range for sure. All right, so, and we, there are more generalized charts like that, this that'll have like, oh, okay. And they're both more general and more specific. Instead of just having one nitrogen example, there's ammonia and then there's um, methylamine, and then there's a, ter a secondary amine, and then there's a tertiary amine. They're all going to have slightly different ranges for their pKa's. So you can get more detailed than this when it comes to these functional groups. But this is the way you use a chart like this, is to say, okay, I can recognize some pieces of my molecule on this chart. Which one is highest is going to give me the 
the most acidic proton. Some secondary though, right? This is a secondary alcohol. We don't have a secondary alcohol on here, but if we have a primary and a tertiary, we can assume secondary is going to be right in there somewhere. Maybe not linearly, maybe not 17, uh, but definitely in that ballpark. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll start doing some practice with the easy or simplified math without doing real ice tables. So let's come back to 10 after.
So what will our exams be on Tuesdays or Thursdays? Think that so finals week's always weird. Um, and we have to go with whatever they say. Although we do have built in time to do the final on Tuesday because we have the lab. And so I know you're all available for the lab time slot, but there's no final schedule there. So it'll, it, the final will probably be on Tuesday. I have to bring the lab time slot so I can give give everybody an extra hour of time if you want it. Yeah. These aren't like the gen chem tests where there's time pressure. Yeah. Right? There's some, but people typically finish their OCHEM tests a lot faster because there's fewer like there's fewer math problems. So in so this all usually it's like you know it or you don't. Um, so and I don't remember what we said for the midterm, but I could be I could be persuaded to do it either way. Okay. Let's see if there's a day that works better for you. Let's see, the schedule is already outdated because of last week. Um, I had forgotten I was going to this wedding when I when I initially brought up or wrote the uh, schedule. We had the exam scheduled for Thursday for on Halloween day. Um, That would probably stick to that. We might just, we might not get through quite as much of the, the lead up. So, is that going to get pushed in the November the exam, or are we still going to? We could. So, again, I, I, I probably don't want to put it into November because it's already in week seven. Um, what might make more sense would be to put it on the Tuesday. Of week seven and cover one less chapter. Okay. So but when we when we get to week six in a couple of weeks, we'll see where we are and how what, what kind of progress we've been making. And it doesn't make sense to try and get all six chapters, or does it make more sense to keep the test in week seven or maybe even I don't think I'd move it all the way to week six. Um, but that can be a dialogue. That's not just me deciding. Obviously, I know the material and what's coming better, um, but I don't know what everybody else has for classes and, and work schedules and everything. So, um, is there do Tuesdays or Thursdays work better, or does it help to have it be consistent? Yeah, we're scheduled for Tuesday for the final. It doesn't make a difference to me. I'm really just. In school for this class. <laughs> yeah, I think it makes sense. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, then during finals week, at least then you can be done earlier. I mean, I can have all, every, everybody's final grades graded by, by Wednesday then um, with a class this small. Um, and then you'll know, you'll know early. And, and, and I think, but I guess usually what I do is your lab final is a, is a write up is a report um, and that's not due until the end of finals week so that would give you some time to just focus on finishing up the lab report if we had a test on tuesday so we'll stick with the test on tuesday for finals week and then i don't know what we're going to do with the midterm because it's just a wonky positioning in the in the curriculum you think we're going to be able to get through all the labs Labs, we should. We didn't miss a lab last week, and it, it actually was already on the schedule for, for a two-week lab. Um, so we're looking good. So we're looking fine on, on that. Um, Is that going to be like a final project type of thing, like Gen Kim? There will be, but it'll be more, it'll be basic. So this lab six, this extraction of essential oils, um we're going to use two that are that have really well-defined products that are pretty easy to work with um we'll do clove and lemon um 
you can extract the essential oils and the essential oils are relatively pure. And then your final exam is I'm going to give you a different plant material. And you have to, like, you know, you're, you're not going to use a spice grinder if I give you fresh cilantro, for instance. Like you say, it would be like small adjustments to the procedure. You're going to have a procedure that worked for lemon oil and clove, and I'm going to give you something that's neither of those, and you have to do the same thing. And there's there's usually like a couple wrinkles that wind up coming out. How much do I have to use? And you might have to go look up some things and plan out your own procedure. Think, okay, if it's a fresh herb, I have to use more than if it's a then I have to use for clove because this herb is doesn't have as much oil in it. And so we do things like rosemary. Um, I got a lot of fresh mint at home. Mint. Um, yeah, that's actually the first, um, the uh, essential oil of black pepper is actually why it's called pepper spray. You take the essential oil of black pepper, um, it is, and then you just make a, an aerosol spray out of it. That's all pepper spray is. So I had somebody last year who, want, who volunteer wanted to do to make pepper spray basically by doing that. Um, and then the other thing is that a lot of those other unknowns um, have multiple components in them. There's not just one component that you get out of it. And so the analysis part is a little more of a guessing game because I basically make it impossible for you to go look up what your compound is because it could be one of 10 things. Um, so that you, and then because then you'll have to interpret the spectra um, that I give you basically. So yes, there will be a lab final. Um, it'll basically just be a rehash of lab six. Um, and you'll have a week to do the procedure and try the procedure again if it doesn't work the first time. And then when you're done with the procedure and you get your essential oil, I'll give you the IR spectrum and the NMR spectrum so that you can um, try and figure out what that structure is for those for that compound. All right, we were just talking about the uh, the midterm as well. Um, I don't, we probably won't push, I know I said earlier we were about a week behind now, but I don't really want to push the midterm back into week eight because then there's only a couple of weeks before the final. <clears throat> so what I'll we'll probably do is cover a little bit less before the midterm and the day the midterm might change. We'll, we'll see how the next couple of weeks go. And then sometime in week six, by two, Tuesday of week six, two weeks from today, probably is we'll, we'll set the date for the midterm and give you a practice list. Mm -hmm. And it'll be probably just a little bit different than the test I usually give because of the last week. Nobody showed up here on Thursday, did they? Okay, good. I'm always a little bit nervous that people miss the memo on that. All right, so here's our group. Again, it's the, the real name for it is the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. There's, uh, again, with the Northern European names for acid-based stuff. Um, they both got their names on the equation, and all they did was they took the definition of equilibrium and rearranged it. Um, that's what I was going to do. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Sometimes it's all about shifting your frame of reference, right? Um, but it frequently just gets called the buffer equation, especially in in bio classrooms, because that's most of what you use it for in a bio classroom is just how am I going to make a buffer so that my cells can grow or so that I can do a specific extraction that needs to be at a certain pH. Um, <clears throat> so let's practice using that. So try to start by, so benzoic acid is a benzene with a carboxylic acid attached to it. So 
So what is the, write out the reaction as an equilibrium reaction with water. And then try to answer it. I'll give you a couple minutes to think, to do that and think about this second question. <clears throat> So the acid base reaction, again, makes it really easy to see your conjugate base, right? Because it's the same exact molecule missing an H plus. So if the solution has a pH of 7.2 and the pKa of benzoic acid is 4.2, is more of the acid protonated or deprotonated? Yeah, so the other way that it helps with these to think about is to think about pH of a solution as being a number line. And then, but really, your, the point that you want to pay the most attention to is your pKa. Everything this direction. Is more basic. And if everything is more basic, if it's if your pH is more basic than your pKa, you're gonna have more of it as the product. Everything this way is gonna be more acidic. If it's more acidic than the pKa, you have more of it than the protonated. The actual ratio depends on what that difference is. Every pH unit of one is a factor of 10 difference. So if the pH is 7.2, pKa is 4.2, what's the ratio of protonated to deprotonated? Yeah, three pH units, so 10 to the three. Technically, I suppose it's 999 to one, make the pieces add up to a thousand, but within sig figs. <laughs> it's a lot easier to think about it like this than it is to actually track the math and what percentage is it? Trying to actually put it into a percentage makes it weird. Wouldn't, but wouldn't this just be a thousand and a thousand? This, yeah, and the one. One is the denominator. So right. That's the ratio. That's It gets weird. Sorry. There, there is a way to do it so that the math gets weird. And so I try not to look at it too hard and just lean on. Okay. It's all in the same face. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but yes, you're right. It is over one. So a thousand and one. It's if I, I can't say one out of every thousand, that's where it's technically yeah, so, yeah. it's not one out of every thousand. <laughs> it's a thousand to one ratio. Um, all right, so the other word on this slide I want to look at 
It's right there. We haven't really used that term yet. It means exactly what it sounds like, but it is not interchangeable with pro ionized and unionized is not exactly interchangeable with pronated and depronated because that depends on the actual functional group. Some functional groups become ionized when they're protonated. If you have a weak base, it gets ionized when it gets protonated. In this case, if it's carboxylic acid, it's unionized when it's protonated. When you deprotonate it, it becomes ionized. And the water becomes protonated and ionized. Yeah, so in this case, here's our water acting as our weak base. So the water is becoming gets protonated and also ionized. So you can't use the terms interchangeably. But that said, ionized is not a particularly different, difficult word, right? Because it says exactly what it means. Why does that matter? Well, would you expect this molecule to be soluble in water? Think back to your solubility test from two weeks ago. Did the benzoic acid dissolve easily in water? But it didn't dissolve particularly well. If you put it into a basic solution, or something that's buffered at pH of seven, does this dissolve well in water? It's got a full on charge, right? It's not just polar, it's also got an action, is an actual ion. So the acid base chemistry, whether something is protonated or not, will affect its solubility as well. And that's what today's lab is all about. You can have a mixture of two compounds that are both neutral, one's a weak acid, one's a weak base. And by tweaking the pH of the solution, you can get one of them to dissolve in water and the other one to precipitate out. So this is actually a really useful way of separating compounds. If you know what their pKa's are, what their structures are, we can play with the pH to help get one to dissolve better than the other. And in general, ionized is always going to dissolve better in water. With these organic compounds, they're usually larger compounds like this that have nonpolar regions. Even if it'll dissolve in water a little bit, it'll dissolve better once it's ionized. And if you can, if we drop the pH to the point where most of it's hanging out like this, we can also limit its solubility in water, get it to dissolve better in a nonpolar solvent, say. Is this one of our reactions for the lab or? I don't remember. It's okay, it's, it's gonna be something similar to that. It's carboxylic acid, benzoic acid is common cheap and easy to work with. I was just saying, so, I wasn't sure what the other reactant was. It was the water or was it the uh, sodium? Um, if we have something that's a better base than water, then that will typically be the, the molecule that acts as the base. So, so you have to compare. Most weak bases are better weak base than water. Gotcha. Okay. So a couple of things that affect PK, if you don't have that table, PK values sitting in front of you, we can still work out in advance um, while, whether which of these two groups we'd expect to be more acidic. So whether you remember that, that chart or not, if nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, which of these is going to be more, more acidic? The alcohol versus the and why the more electronegative atom is going to steal the electron density more so than the lesser electronegative. Yeah, and the other way you can think about it is the more electronegative element is going to be more stable with a negative charge. For both of these, you're going to get a negative charge once you deprotonate it, right? Your conjugate base in this case is going to be. These are our conjugate bases, right? Okay, not reacting together. Separate. Not reacting together. Just 
with another with something else that can that can uh, depropionate it. A nitrogen with a negative charge is not as stable as an oxygen with a negative charge. It's the exact same logic. It's the, the opposite side of the point for what you both just said a second ago. Oxygen is better at pulling electron density towards itself, which means this bond is more polar. More polar bond is a weaker bond. It's easier to break that hydrogen, that oxygen hydrogen covalent bond because it's less covalent. So, and we can apply this to the function group as a whole, right? Amines in general are less acidic than alcohols because of the difference in electronegativity. And where would carbon be in here? Be more acidic if we had a carbon hydrogen bond. Be more acidic, less acidic, or in between these two. Less acidic. Less acidic. Yeah, because that's like closer to it's closer to a true covalent bond, holds on to those those hydrogens better. So a so that would be less acidic than the amine, which is less acidic. Than the alcohol. Is it wrong to think of that reverse as basic? The carbon would be more basic, or you got to think about it in terms of the conjugate, the conjugate base. Yeah. So the amine is less acidic than the alcohol. The deprotonated amine is a better base than the deprotonated alcohol. Okay. Those are always go hand in hand. If it's a worse acid, then the conjugate base is a better base. This chart, right, is these two arrows. They're inverse. Quick. So if you're at a pH of seven, would you expect an amine to be protonated or unprotonated? Sure. You're more acidic than the pKa, right? You're more acidic than the pKa, it's gonna be in its protonated state. <laughs> and you definitely would expect the alcohol to be all protonated at pH of seven. Maybe you know somewhere in that that hundred to one thousand to one range is going to be deprotonated for the amine, but the alcohol is going to be one a billion to one protonated. Versus unprotonated. So technically in equilibrium, but very, very heavily favoring the protonated state. So the if we we can also look at the size of the atoms, larger anions, it's similar to delocalization. The more you can delocalize the negative charge, the more stable it is through resonance. You can do the same thing just in terms of sheer size of an atom. A sulfur is more acidic than an oxygen. Even, even though oxygen is more electronegative, simply because the sulfur is a larger space. Then last, the one we've been working with more, resonance. If you have to choose between the stability, again, we're looking at stability of the conjugate base. If you can delocalize the charge, it's going to be more stable. And that, the size one, this middle one, 
uh, is less important than resonance and electronegativity usually. And it's, it winds up showing up less often. Um, it winds up being, in particular, sulfurs versus oxygen. The difference between those two winds up being really important when you get to biochemistry because there's a few amino acids that have that have uh, SH groups on their side chains. And the difference in, in acidity between an alcohol and a, and a thiol winds up making a big difference in how proteins fold in your body. But it's kind of a niche application from a, a general standpoint. We're still at the general standpoint. All right, so how, do I, how can I ask questions about this? Similar to the way we've already seen, which proton is more acidic? So we've already answered one like this, right? Is red or blue more acidic? Yeah. Thiol or an alcohol? The thiol. This one, you might have to draw out the two conjugate bases. If the red proton is removed, you get this, right? Which has resonance, right? Which has resonance because you've got a charge in the allylic position. No resonance. You do it the other way around, wind up with this, that has no resonance. This negative charge can't go that way because that's an sp3 carbon. And it can't resonate this way because this carbon already has a pi bond participating in resonance. So the red one is more acidic because the conjugate base is more stable due to the resonance. So the resonance of the conjugates are what is important. In because life. that's what's going to make, if anything, if it has a lot of resonance, when it's, I can't think of a case where this would be the True, but if you manage to come up with a structure where there was more resonance in the protonated form, that's not going to be a very good acid because you'd have to lose resonance to give up a proton. The reason these are good acids is because you gain resonance by giving up a proton. Right, so the, the stability of the conjugate bases drives these because by making it more downhill in energy, that's more favorable. All right, so if we'd had a whole hour, this would have been the, the warm up question for today's lecture if we'd actually gotten through the lectures um, last week as planned. Um, but it should look really similar, just with different numbers, right? So what does the conjugate base look like? We're just gonna pull that hydrogen off, right? All right, so 
the pH is lower than pKa? Is the solution more acidic or more basic than the pKa? More acidic. When pH is lower, that means extra H3O plus on out. Okay. Because there's that negative on the on the log term. Right, yeah. I thought you were asking which one of the molecules may seem more. I so know. I would use I won't say more acidic or more basic, I'll say protonated or deprotonated. So this one would be it would be more protonated. More of it's protonated because the solution is more acidic. I'll try never to use the term acidic to describe a molecule. I'll use acidic to describe solutions. Solutions can be acidic or basic. Molecules can be acids or bases. Subtle distinction, but that kind of keeps us from getting lost in that language a little bit. Like I just did. Right. <laughs> so the, what is the ratio of protonated to deprotonated? We can set up the buffer equation and solve for the ratio or we so 10 to the negative 1.3. So something close to 10 to 1 in favor of the protonated form. I don't actually know what 10 to the negative 1.3 is. It's probably like One of one over twenty-five. Would it not be the tenth root of ten cubed? Oh, don't make me do more. Than that. <laughs> All right. So here's the key for today's lab. In the one, this is one more level of abstraction. But if you can understand this one applying solubility to the results you have to be internally consistent and it can get a little bit tricky um, but it's not the concepts aren't that hard it's just they're all piling up on top of each other now right we've got relative acid strength we've got ph versus pka and we've got ionized versus unionized Protonated versus deprotonated. Protonated versus deprotonated. Polar versus non-polar. And so now the last piece of this is, okay, ionized will always dissolve better in a polar solvent. Unionized will always dissolve better in a non-polar solvent. So when it's neutral, it's going to dissolve better in a non-polar solvent. And we're all just dealing with this in qualitatively still. These, this is not a perfectly nonpolar molecule, so it still will dissolve a little bit in water, but not easily. It doesn't have a high solubility in terms of grams per liter. But if you change the pH, you can get that, that solubility either decrease or, or increase, just like changing the, the temperature caused the, the solubility to change a lot, right? So here is the big picture way of phrasing it. Solution has a pH of 6.5. pKa of benzoic acid is 4.2. Will the molecule be more stable in water or in nonpolar solvent? It's nonpolar. So walk your, you got to walk your way through the steps every time. First look at this. Is it going to be charged? Or is it going to be ionized or unionized? Or you can both step back, protonated versus unprotonated. Mostly, mostly protonated still because pH is higher than mostly protonated. Or sorry, unprotonated. So the solution is more basic uh, mm. than the pKa. Okay. So that means that out of these two options, so more deprotonated. More deprotonated. Okay. okay. It's going to be more deprotonated. And for this functional group, deprotonated means charged. So if it's charged, we would expect it to dissolve better in water. And so really, the trickiest part of these is you kind of have to go through that logic every time. 
here's my protonated versus my deprotonated. Or, and then look at, okay, which of these two is more common? And then once we decide that this one is more common, we have to say, okay, does that dissolve better in water or non-polar solvent? So it's kind of three levels that you have to go through. And if you mess up anywhere along the way, then you're going to get the wrong answer. It's, it seems like it's a coin flip, right? It is a coin flip. It's a true false question, basically, right? But getting there, <clears throat> it's tricky. And this is, this is the sort of question that's a 50-50 shot that I could make it really, I learned a trick from one of my professors in college. Um, he would give true false questions, but if the answer was false, then you had to correct the statement. Oh. So, based, so you would have to go through and say, if I messed up somewhere in there, in one of my levels, you'd have to find where I messed up and say less soluble instead of more soluble or um, something along those lines. So because there's so many levels of abstraction, it seems like a simple 50-50 shot, but you've got to get be consistent through it, or you're not going to get the right answer. I think me and Jerry did the same thing. We flipped yeah. the, the HA over A minus, is what we said, <laughs> instead of A minus over HA. Yes. <laughs> so, what's the first rule of equilibrium? Uh, Products over reactions, <laughs> right? <laughs> Deprotonated form is the product. All right. I think I have some more practice like that that we can go over. Let me pull up the next set of slides and we'll work through that some more. There we go. That is all I had initially. So let's do another example that I will what does the um <clears throat> Let's say we had a protonated amine instead of a carboxylic acid. It reacts with what well, amines when they act as a weak acid. It's a protonated amine. Then it's got a positive charge when it acts as a weak acid. You're still going to get H3O plus. Now, ionized versus unionized is flipped, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's unionized when it's deprotonated. And the pKa for this is about 8.5. So if a solution Will the molecule dissolve better in water or non-polar solvent? Would it be non be better in non-polar? Because if the pH is lower, then it will be 
lower than the pKa, then it will be more protonated. The more protonated molecule will dissolve in a nonpolar. So if pH is 6.5, more of it is protonated. Yeah. Which of these sides is protonated? In this one's charged. Which In that one's, one's charged. charged. Oh, okay. so then it would, okay. So, <laughs> so that's the ionized for Yeah, exactly. exactly. So it's ionized when it's acidic, if it's an amine. Versus carboxyl carboxylic acids were ionized when they were in basic conditions. Yeah. So if it's ionized when it's in its protonated form, we're more acidic here, the molecule should be more soluble in water. And, to, and again, this is what I'm going to do, what the lab is today. Part of what the lab is today is I'm going to give you another random mixture of two powders and have you separate them again. Kind of like we did last time. So last time we did it with... Um, or I just had you look at the melting point. I don't think I had you separate the salicylic acid and the naphthalene, whatever it was, right? Um, that was two weeks ago now. This time to separate them, if I give you something that's a weak base and something that's a weak acid, we can adjust the pH to, to adjust the solubility. Initially, in neutral water, they'll both be soluble in water. So are we going with three chemicals? In the lab report, it said diphenylamine, benzoic acid, and naphthalene. So naphthalene. That's just always going to be dissolved in. Does, does naphthalene have a acidic proton? A really bad hexagon. It could, right? If the pH was. If you could get the pH up to about 50. Oh, right on. Oh, well, there it is. Uh, that the pKa for, for carbon hydrogens is between 40 to 50. Oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> okay. So basically, nothing that we're going to do in water can deprotonate in that point. Yeah. But if you've got a, you said salicylic acid? Uh, diphenylamine, benzoic acid, and so diphenylamine looks like this. Also not a great hexagon, but better than the last one. So there's diphenylamine. And then what's the last one? Uh, benzoic acid. Benzoic acid, we already looked at. So benzoic acid is going to be a carboxylic acid, meaning that at low pHs, it'll be unprotonated. The pKa for amines is about nine. So I'm going to erase the naphthalene because we just decided it will never be deprotonated in water. And PKA is about four. Four comes up on the last slide. It doesn't matter. So if you're above a pH of four, this is going to be soluble in water, right? If you're below a pKa or a pH of nine, this is going to be soluble in water because what's the protonated, this is a weak base, not a weak acid. What's the protonated form going to look like then? Positive charge. So if you're below their pKa's, this is what they will look like. One's charged and one's not. If you're above their pKa's, their solubilities are going to flip. Because if you're above their pKa's, this is deprotonated and becomes neutral. This is deprotonated and becomes charged. If you're between their pKa's, they're both going to be soluble in water. Because if you're between their pKa's, we have a pH of seven. This is mostly deprotonated. This is mostly protonated. But when that one's protonated, it has 
the positive charge so that it is soluble. Soluble. Exactly. So that's, I have to like make that connection. There. Right. Yeah. So, and that's where we'll leave it until until uh, lab at one. Is we're going to be we're going to be have a system with all three of these mixed together, and we're going to try and separate out the naphthalene from the benzoic acid from the uh, diphenylamine just by messing with the pH. So based on where we started with this, naphthalene is always going to be in the nonpolar right. solvent. In a, which makes the rest of under an extremely basic <laughs> solution, in an extremely basic solution, your mean will be in the nonpolar, and your acid will be in the in the water. At extremely acidic solutions, the acid will be in in the nonpolar, and the amine will be in the water. Okay. So hydrochloric acid, we'll put that into... Think about it in terms of the solution, not what we're going to use to adjust the pH. Okay. By adjusting the pH to be more acidic, we can change which of them dissolves in the water. So it's wrong to think of it as them sort of reacting. It's just all happening around each other. We're right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> all right. We'll end there.